There are forces in the world today who oppose our Christian faith. They attempt to destroy everything that's holy and control what preachers say. But God still has a few good men who will bend, won't bow, or burn. They will fight to the end to defend that faith until the day that the whole world learns. There are things we won't give over. There are things worth fighting for. The book and the blood and the rugged cross. One faith, one way, one Lord. When the world and the flesh and the devil press on and try to tear our strongholds down, we will stand our ground. It is now and forever the same. The world may think they have won this fight, but there are some who can still be found. Will we never give in and we never give up. We will stand our ground. There are things we won't give over. There are things worth fighting for. The book and Blood and the rugged cross, one faith, one way, one Lord. When the world and the flesh and the devil press on and try to tear our strongholds down, we will stand our ground. There are things we won't give over, there are things we're fighting for. Blood and the rugged cross, one faith, one way, one Lord. When the world and the flesh and the devil press on and try to tear our strongholds down, we will stand our ground. When the world and the flesh and the devil press on and try to tear our strongholds down. Father, we bless your name for our gathering together at this time. For such a great occasion, Men of Valor Conference. Lord, how could we become men of valor, men of courage, men of conviction, men that can take the battle to the enemy and turn the battle to the gates? Apart from your hand being upon us, your strength, your enablement, your empowering, everything. And even all this, how do we come by them apart from spending time in your presence? To know you so intimately, to have you inject onto us your very life and power so that when we emerge and we reach to the place of ministry, your hand upon our lives be so evident. Everyone will see the impact will speak for itself. Make us such men in Jesus' name. As we come today, we are asking that every one of us will be so focused and attentive and your hand will come upon us in a way we've never experienced before. That by the end of today, 
you would have made us another man in Jesus' name. Reach out to us as we share your word together. In Jesus' name we pray. Our standing before God. And, and what a message from the song that we have just heard. That when the devil, when the world, when Satan, everybody conspiring to tear down our stronghold, we will not give up our ground. We will not surrender. We will not cringe. We will not buckle. Now that's a great message. But how is that going to happen? How are we going to stand our ground and not cringe and not buckle and not give any, you know, room to the enemy? Our standing before God. Now, when I got the title, I saw something in parentheses which gave me context. It says, practice and power of personal prayer. So for my own message, I simply wrote, I'm standing before God. Instead of parentheses, I put colon. Because that's the context. That's the perspective. Practice and power of personal prayer. That's what gives us the standing we ought to have before the almighty God. I pray you have such a standing. Amen. Now a man went into a bank to keep an appointment with the bank manager because his uh, account was in a bit of a mess. But upon entering the manager's office and you know, rubbing his hands together with some measure of glee, he asked the manager, how do I stand for a 10K loan? And the manager looked him straight in the eyes and said, man, you don't stand, you grovel. You don't stand, you do what? You grovel. What does he grovel? You crawl on the ground. You lie on your face. As we look at our standing before God, brethren, this has a lot to do with our prayer life. It does. It's not just about posture. <laughs> it's read standing. No, we are not just talking about posture in prayer. But the reputation we have built with the courts of heaven through prayerfulness. Does heaven recognize your voice? And just how well? Does the almighty God have to say, angels, who is that? Or the moment you start, Father, in the name of Jesus, say, that's one so. I, I know that is him. That is him. Amen? In 1 Kings chapter 17, 1 Kings chapter 17, I begin reading from verse 1. 1 Kings 17, and from verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto him, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall, be, there shall not be dew nor rain this year, but according to my word. Uh, there's something, if you like, you can categorize as a rude introduction. Where is this man coming from? Do you know before this time, we never even heard about him? That's right. And it's like, enter, and this man came in. Here comes Elijah the Tishbite. Who is his father? <laughs> not important. Who is his mother? Not important. But as for his tribe, who is his of Tishbite? Right? And this man came in as if from nowhere. And he said unto Ahab, if you have studied that man Ahab as a king, wh what a terrible man. He's not the kind of king you mess with if you still need your life. But this man came and said unto Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain this year, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. I, I'm sure we all know this uh, story. God has been displeased with Israel because the people have gone into all kinds of ungodliness because of idolatry. And so God needed a man for the kind of reformation that is unprecedented. And so he found Elijah. And Elijah was up to the task. 
he came and told the king what was going to happen. No fear, nothing. Talk about a man of valor. Talk about a man of courage. He came, he gave that message with a straight face. Now you know what happened after them. He said he was standing before God. What does that mean in plain language? Is it just that he comes before the almighty God, that's the throne of God there, and he stands there before whom I stand. And he was saying, I'm a prayerful man. I'm a man that gives myself to prayer. And brethren, let it sink into our spirit that the place of prayer is the place of revelation. The place of prayer, that is where you hear God smile. That's where God has opportunity to say things to you, co to communicate things with your spirit so that we are not men that are just roaming about. That don't know things are just happening. We have no clue where they are coming from. No, it shouldn't be like that. He said, before whom I stand, I declare. No, it was not just Elijah declaring his mind. Elijah was telling them what God was up to. Ahab, this is what to expect. There is not going to be rain. Hallelujah. And before he came to make this authoritative declaration, he has spent time in the secret place with the Almighty God. I pray you will know that place. Amen. Secret place. And if we move on to chapter 18 of that same first Kings, it says in verse 15, and Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts liveth, again, before whom I stand, before whom I stand. Please understand, we are not talking about just a posture. No, we are talking about a kind of lifestyle, a kind of, you know, devotion that God has my attention, God has my time. I spend quality time with God, and then when I come out, because I've spent time, Talking to God about men, now I can come out and talk to men about God. Amen? But too many people want to come and talk to men about God, but they don't have time to talk to God about men. And that's why we make a mess of it. Here again it says, as the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. What had happened was, after the rain disappeared and the drought came in and everywhere was followed. That even the animals were dying for want of water and things like that. And Ahab said, uh, my friend, um, come, let's go and see. Where can we find some water to spare some of this flock? There was nowhere he didn't send to look for Elijah. And when they said Elijah was not in that part of the country, he would take an oath from them. They must swear that he's not there, not that they are hiding him. And so he came and he told this, this poor man, Obadiah, that Obadiah, Go and tell Ahab, Elijah is here. Obadiah said, what have I done? I should go and tell Ahab, Elijah said, where has he not looked for you? These three and a half years. And he made them to swear that you are not in their country. Now you say, I should go and tell him, Elijah is here. And by the time I tell him and come back, the spirit of God that carried you elsewhere. And then he will cut off my head. He said, no, I'm not going anywhere. I'll be here. And he went and told Ahab. When Ahab came and saw Elijah, he said, I, 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 I doubt you, oh, my enemy. He said, you troubler of Israel. I said, no, I do not trouble. It's your father's house that has been troubling Israel. You don't talk like that, right? What did you have for breakfast? No, it takes courage. It takes valor to be able to talk like that. He said, no, I'm not the troubler of Israel. It's you and your father's house that have troubled Israel. And now look at it here. If we skip to verse 36. In verse 36, he now said, and it came to pass at the time of the evening offering, of the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Well, in between, we've skipped the contest between him and the prophets of Baal, right? And he has challenged the people of God that why are you halting between two opinions? If God be God, serve him. If Bear then serve him. The prophets of Bear took their sacrifice. They cried from morning to evening. Bear is dead. Nothing happened. And then towards the time of evening sacrifice, say, now you come here, you people. Let me demonstrate to you that there's a God in heaven. And then he arranged the altar. What a significant thing. The altar that was broken. What's the state of the altar of prayer in our own lives? What's the state? Is it covered in ashes? Or is the fire still burning on it? Significant things that this man did here. He repaired the altar and then they cut the sacrifice they put on it. And then he called upon the God of heaven. 
You know the story. What happened? The fire came down from heaven. Hallelujah. And when the fire fell, the people fell as well. They said, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. But you see, what is happening in the land is lack of water. Right? The fire is to demonstrate to the people that God is still on his throne. Amen? And he's still the God of Israel. But we need rain. We need rain. For three and a half years, the whole ground is parched. There's nothing in terms of agricultural produce and what have you. We need rain desperately. And our same man that brought fire down from heaven by the power of prayer is also going to bring water down from heaven. Rain, torrential rain by the same power of prayer. The fire fell. What about the rain? Of course, the rain fell from verse 41. And Elijah said unto Ahab, get thee up. Eat and drink for there's a sound of abundance of rain. Now that takes some courage. Three and a half years have elapsed, not a drop of rain. But you see, when a man is intimate with God and is heard from upstairs, he comes and declares authoritatively without any cringing or no, no iota of doubt in his mind. God has said, go tell that man rain is coming now. No problems. I hear the sound of abundance of rain. May God give us ears of faith. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink. Did Elijah also go to eat and to drink? No. It's not the feasting that will bring the rain. No. It's not the feasting. It's following through on what God has said. That we are going to follow through on this promise that God has made by standing before his presence. That is the habit. That is the lifestyle. And for everything we are going to do, we must do it by standing before God. Right? Having the right standing before God. That when we begin to pray, because of what God has told us, God will not do something else. He will do exactly what he has told us. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. When you get home, try that posture. Put your face between your knees and tell me whether you slept. Right? That was the posture of prayer. That Elijah chose for himself, before whom I stand. This is not standing as on feet. At times you stand better by, by bending your knees. You stand better by bending your knees, on bended knees. And so he put his face between his knees and said to his fat servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There's nothing. <laughs> and he said, When I stood before God in prayer, he didn't say he was sending nothing. He said he was sending rain. Go seven times. Go seven times. Amen? And it came to pass, at the seventh time, it will always come to pass, that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud of the sea, like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot, and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. Do you see something here about this man? We see a cloud, the size of a man's hand. He said, That's all we are waiting for. That is all. Go tell Ahab to prepare to run so that the rain doesn't stop him. Hallelujah. Do you understand? If you learn to stand before God, it does a world of good to your faith. Your faith, your faith becomes so strong. Everything becomes a signal that you can you know, correctly decode that this is what God is saying. We see a cloud the size of a man. That's it. That's what we have been looking for. For three and a half years, it's coming. Tell that king to get ready to run. So that the rain doesn't stop it. In verse 45, and it came to pass. In the meanwhile, that the heaven was black with clouds and wind. And there was, what kind of rain? A great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezre, and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. My brother, that's what will happen to you. When you learn to spend time in the presence of God, his hand will be upon you. Everywhere you go, people will know they are not dealing with an ordinary person. Hallelujah. Why do we go about this? No, we are even demanding respect. They don't give it to us. You don't demand. You command. It. Once you appear, your appearance commands respect. Why? Because of the hand of God is upon you. Right? If you can say with Elijah, before whom I stand, before whom I spend time. Hallelujah. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he guarded up his loins and ran before Ahab. To the entrance of Jezreel. Who won this race? <laughs> Prophet Elijah got the gold medal. Against somebody that was on a chariot. Think about that. 
That's what happens when the hand of God is upon our lives. May the Lord help us. Now, this rather long passage, 1 Kings 17, you know, the rain being cut off, and then 18, the fire falling, the rain now falling, is summarized so beautifully in James chapter 5. Right? You see, the best commentator on scriptures is the Holy Spirit himself. See all that I've been saying to you. Now see the summary that the Spirit of God made of it. James chapter 5 from verse 16. Confess your faults one to another. And pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Does that tell you Elijah was a righteous man? How can you be a man of valor if you're unrighteous? No, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Right? We must keep that garment of righteousness that we've been enrobed with. The righteousness that's of faith through Christ, we must keep it intact. The effectual fervent, somebody said, the real interpretation of that is the fervent boiling prayer. When prayer boils, that's right. Boiling prayer of a righteous man. Because people pray, many people pray, and there's no prayer in their prayer. No. But this one is fervent, is boiling, is hot. It says it availeth much. And for illustration, guess who was brought into view? In verse 17, Elias. That's the Greek rendering of Elijah. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. Do you ever feel discouraged? Elijah was discouraged. Do you ever feel downcast? Elijah, in fact, to the point of entertaining suicidal thoughts. Jezebel said, I kill you. You wait for me. I make your life like one of those prophets of Baal. When he had that, he said, what? He took off. I think maybe the servant was too slow for him. He said, servant, you are not the one Jezebel is threatening. That's why your legs are so heavy. You stay here. And he, he ran faster and they came under a juniper tree. And so, Lord God, is enough now. For I'm not better than my father's. Remember Elijah the Tishbite. We have not told the name of the father. We are not told the name of the mother. But he is saying he's not better than the people that God didn't even bother to, to name. Right? Of course, he's better than them. Right? He said, kill me now. I know like we say, if he was sincere that I wanted to die, he should have waited for Jezebel. Kill me now. God says, no. It's not time to die. Actually, it's chariots of fire that I'm preparing that will carry you to glory. You are not going to taste that. He didn't know that. He didn't know that. Now, what are we talking about? This man is a man subject to like passion as we are. Right? But despite the fact that he's a man subject to like passion, and he prayed, that's the difference. And he prayed, how? Honestly. Honestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth. Is there a mistake here? Or it rained not in Israel. <laughs> it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Hallelujah. This man, by prayer, locked up heaven, put the key in his pockets, and went away. And it that man Ahab was looking for him everywhere. He was nowhere to be found. Then after three and a half years, he go and show yourself to that man. And he came again, the key in his pocket. Ahab had no access. Hallelujah. He says in verse 18, and he prayed again. So we've now come from verse chapter 17 to chapter 18 now. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain. And the earth brought forth fruit. That's the summary of 1 Kings 17 and 18. That's it. But then, if we have as common denominator being men of like passions, the challenge to you and me is then very clear that we should be men of like prayer, not just like passion. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Three things I quickly want to look at. Number one, the place and patterns of personal prayer. The place and patterns of personal prayer. Personal prayer, yes, that's what we want to talk about. We thank God for corporate prayer, even though most of you disappear. We don't see you. Now, that makes me wonder. Somebody that cannot pray in company of men, and probably women, of like precious faith, what are the chances that such a person can pray alone? What are the chances? 
right? The place and patterns of personal prayer. Point number two, the principles and practice of personal prayer. There has to be certain principles we can draw from the patterns in scripture that will then inform the way we pray, our practice of personal prayer. And then, of course, finally, the power and possibilities of personal prayer. Someone once said, you are as poor as your prayer life. And it's true. It's true. Make no mistake about it. Your authority level, spiritual authority, your powerful level, your spiritual power, everything hinges on your prayer life. There are no two ways about it. If anybody tells you there's a shortcut, he says, come on. There's no shortcut. God has so designed it that you are as powerful as your prayer life. Hallelujah. So you see you can be powerful. What does it take? Being prayerful. That's all. Hallelujah. So we'll come to the first point. The place and patterns of personal prayer. This is talking about the vital importance. When you say the place of a thing, that means where it really occupies, where it sits. And oftentimes we use that word to demonstrate just how important it is. The importance of prayer, the centrality of it as the vital breath of the spiritual life. Listen, a prayerless man is dead. He's a dead man. He's a walking corpse. I mean, it's okay physically. He still eats. He talks. He belches when he drinks plenty of fluid and all the rest. He wheezes. That's fine. He uses the toilet. Physically, he's alive. But spiritually, he's dead because he's prayerless. Hallelujah. Without prayer, we are dead spiritually. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ was emphatic on this point when he instructed us in Luke chapter 18. Luke 18 and in verse 1. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. There he said, and he spake a parable unto them. To this end, for this purpose, to give this moral that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Men, and like our brother said when he was uh, leading us in the initial something, that I sat down and I was thinking at this. You see, oftentimes the Bible says man, and it's not gender restrictive. It means man and woman. But when you look critically at this particular verse, men ought always to pray. Jesus was gender restrictive. He said, men, if you are not praying, you are the troublers of Israel. You are the troublers of Israel. And look at our society today. Look at the church of God, even this very church. Yesterday's prayer meeting, for those of you that were here, who were in the majority? The women. The, I don't know what is it about men. But we are the head of the home. We are the head of the family. We, eat, we claim we are head. We just eat the best piece of meat in the soup. That's how we claim our head. Where are the priests? Don't you understand? The priestly man. The priestly man, the one that leads worship in the home, the one that makes sure the prayer altar is ever burning hot. No, 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 not like that. Actually, for many of our homes, it's the prayer of the women that are holding those families. What a shame. What a shame. Look at the person by your side. We must change that. When men occupy their rightful place, things fall into their rightful places. Amen. Why do you want to keep making the same mistake over and over? I kept asking myself, where was Adam when Eve was holding that conference with the devil? If you were there, you think that conference would take place? He said, <coughs> I said, ah, I didn't know you were there, sir. <laughs> Hallelujah. Where was he? Jesus spoke a parable. He taught many things by parable. And when it came to the subject of prayer, so important, so, you know, fundamental, he put it into parable. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. And as if to demonstrate that women were more prayerful, the illustration he drew, he left men alone, he took a woman now. See, there was a woman that came to a judge. Hallelujah. Because somehow, somehow, women are more prayerful. And I say that to my shame as well. And I hope to your shame as a man. We need to change this thing. I say we need to change seats. How is it that you go to any church? I am telling you, there are very, very few churches where men are more than women. Very, very few. 
the normal thing you see is that women are more. And it's usually 60 to 40 in the best places. Why is it like that? Men must rise up. I say men must rise up. Men ought always to pray. Christ was making, you know, emphasis on that point. Because when you look at his own ministry from start to finish, prayer was key to everything he taught and everything he did. Brethren, through prayer, we engage God. Think about that. Prayer gives you the unique opportunity to engage God. While you are praying, you have God's attention. Think about that. Does that thrill you? Does that make you to want to do it more? That goodness me, the creator of the entire universe, when I say Father, is attentive. And for as long, do you see what happened when Abraham was interceding for Sodom? Paradenture, there are, it, we lack five. Will you d- destroy the place for lack of five? No, I will not. S- oh, sorry, I've taken it on myself to speak. Supposing we find ten men for the sake of ten, I will not do it. Ah, and Abraham fell. This whole place, we can't find ten. It's all right then. If there are not enough ten people. And Abraham went his way. What the Bible say? And God departed. For as long as Abraham was speaking, God was all ears. Doesn't that thrill you? Does that want you to, to, to want to be a real prayer warrior? Because while you are praying, you have God's attention. Through prayer, we engage God. Through prayer, God enables us. We engage him. He enables us. And through prayer, God enlarges his kingdom. Let us pray. I've not finished. I'm just saying, let us pray. Let's be prayerful people. I can see some of you may rise up and I say, ah, that was a very short message. <laughs> Praise the Lord. If this is true, and it is, then let us pray. And let us pray more. Amen? In Luke chapter 21 and in verse 36. Remember I said, when we talk about our standing before God, we are not just talking about posture and prayer. We are talking about the reputation we have built. We are talking about status. We are talking about, you know, our standing, our position before God. That's what we are saying. And do you know you can improve your status before God? All you need to do is be prayerful. That's all. That's all. I read about um, David Brainerd, and I'm saying, what a man. What a man. And what shocked me was that this, this prayer warrior lived for only 29 years. He died at 29. And I read about him somewhere that he prays on the average 17 hours a day. Boy, if I, when I get to heaven, those are the kind of people I want to draw to the side and say, excuse me, sir, what were you talking about? <laughs> 17 hours. Somebody in his mind is now saying, Pastor, he hasn't got my job. It's not my kind of job. Can't pray on 17 hours and they fire you. Yeah? They don't fire people who pray 17 hours. <laughs> Hallelujah. In Luke chapter 21 and in verse 36, we see Jesus in prayer. What do they notice about his posture? Luke 21, did I say? Luke 21, verse 36. Oh, watch it therefore, and pray always that I may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. To stand before the Son of Man. Is it just standing? As in standing. I'm standing. No, it's to be counted worthy of one of those that the Son of Man will take with him when he comes we take as, you know, worthy of being in the kingdom of God. The place of prayer. We ought always to pray. Is that important? The place of prayer, that it makes us watchful. It makes us ready for the coming of the Lord. Because if we are prayerless, by the time the Lord will come, we will find us where we are not supposed to be. That will not happen to you in Jesus' name. As you look at the ministry of the apostles in the Acts, a problem cropped up in the church. Mormoning started coming up, and they realized how dangerous Mormoning is in Acts chapter 6. Oh, the Grecians were saying they were discriminating against them, and they saw, you know, growing churches have growing problems as well. And the moment the apostles had wind of that, they knew if we don't nip this thing in the bud, 
the enemy will come in, and before you know it, a lot of damage will be done. So they said, people, it is not meet that we should leave this word of God to serve table. Choose you seven men, and they gave the criteria. Honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, set them over this. In verse 4 of Acts chapter 6, but we, we give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. To prayer and to, uh, the, please, preachers should take notes. Look at it. Number one, prayer. Prayer. And then the ministry of the word. You cannot change the order. It's not ministry of the word and prayer. What are you preaching, man? It's prayer first. Amen? Prayer first. Why would they have this kind of attitude? Because, you know, they knew that if we are talking about real victory, it's going to take prayer. If we are going to preach, you know, the heart of God into the hearts of men, it's going to take prayer. You know, um, such as Podium once said that, look, if you preach... And by the end of that preaching, everybody is saying, what a preacher. What a preacher. They say, what a shame. Say the right thing after you have preached is they should say, what a savior. What a savior. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. It is our prayerfulness that makes the message we are preaching to connect to the hearts of the people. And that's what we need because that's what is going to do them good. We will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. So we see very clearly, looking at praying men in scriptures. If we start with Jacob, a Jabok, and we watch him wrestle in Genesis 32, a passage we are quite familiar with, and we see the outcome of that wrestling, that this man was so desperate for the help of God that I will not allow this angelic visitor to go like that. I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And the Bible says this angel had to dislocate Jacob's tie. But Jacob wrestled on. He wrestled on. The angel knew this man. What's your name? He said, Jacob. You are no more Jacob. Your name shall be called Israel. Because as a prince has thou power with God and with men and has prevailed. Now when you look at that, you need to wait. Pause. Study it closely. What do I see here? And Jacob was left alone. And Jacob was left alone. How is it that some people, they are so loud in congregational prayer, they so, but they don't have any personal prayer. That one is so uninspiring. It's so, but when there's opportunity for people to hear them, are you a Pharisee? Are you a hypocrite? Oh, they shout at the whole. They, they say, ah, brother, so and so. If God can give me his prayer life, he has none. All you see is all that is there in the congregation. As for private, there's nothing. Nothing at all. How should it be like that? It shouldn't be like that. We are not showmen. Praise or private prayer does not admit of showmanship. Who are you doing show for? The almighty God. You say, excuse me. <laughs> are you all right? There's no room for show off in the presence of the almighty. Amen? That's where we grow in humility. That's where we grow in meekness. That's where we can afford to derobe ourselves completely because we know he knows everything anyway. So if you are wise, what are you trying to cover up? And Jacob was left alone. After all the scheming and everything, he knew this will not work. I better get real. He sent everybody across and Jacob was left alone. In First Chronicles chapter 4, First Chronicles chapter 4, we go from Jacob to Jabez. In 1 Chronicles chapter 4, reading here from verse 9. 1 Chronicles chapter 4. And from verse 9, here we are told about this man again, as if from nowhere, like Elijah. We've not read anything about his pedigree or any such thing. The man just said, and Jabez was more. Uh, where is Jabez? Read the genealogy. Every name that's been. We've not encountered Jabez before. But the first time we are seeing this man, we saw a praying man. We saw a prayerful man. I pray your life will be like that. That when people meet you for the first time, what stands out clear is that he's a praying man. He's a praying man, not a political man. No, not a man that knows how to, you know, corner people together to take advantage of them. No, he says here concerning Jabez, he says, and Jabez was more honorable than his brethren. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, 
because I bear him with sorrow. And I thought about it. What made him more honorable than his brethren? Something tell me is because he knew how to stand before God. He was a praying man. That's it. Look at verse 10. And Jabez called on the God of Israel. And Jabez called on the God of Israel. You see, it's not just enough to pray. Who are you praying to? Who are you praying to? Some people, they find it difficult to spend time with God, to seek the face of God, but they pester men. They pester men about their need, about their difficulties. They pester human beings, but they can't talk to God. They can't spend time with God. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed. This man knew that the blessing of the Lord is what makes rich and added no sorrow with it. He said, oh, that thou wouldst bless me indeed and enlarge my cause and that thy hand might be with me and that thou wouldest keep me from evil that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. Brother Jabez got everything he asked for. Hallelujah. Do you know something? Sorrow got out of his life. He was no longer brother sorrow. That's it. And what do we see? We saw a man that knew his situation. We saw a man that knew his circumstance. And when it came to talking to God, he prayed intelligent prayer that met the situation of his life. How do people go to God? They are neither here nor there, and they are praying for a car. What do you want to do with a car? Look at your condition. So how does the car help your condition? Look at your spirituality. How does your prayer request address your spirituality? Look at the habits that have bound you with chains. Instead of talking to God to break those chains, you, all those ones are still there. You are asking for things that have no value whatsoever in terms of increasing your godliness quotient, so to say. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. As we move from Jabez to Jeremiah, what do we find? Jeremiah chapter 33. Jeremiah Chapter 33, I'm reading here in verse 3, Jeremiah 33. If you've heard me sp you know, speak on this before, I always tell you, this is God's telephone number. Jeremiah 33, verse 3, it says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. Hallelujah. Yeah. Which thou, the place of prayer is the place of revelation. Don't let us go about like blank people groping at noonday. Because of prayerlessness. If we come to God and spend time with God, we know what is happening in the affairs of our lives. We'll be able to talk to God about it and be able to open up to us that my son, this is what is happening. My son, this is what is going on. And I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest. That's not even part of your prayer request. Why? Because it does exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Come to Master Jesus. What do we say about Master Jesus? Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Mark chapter 1, and in verse 35. Mark 1, and in verse 35. And in the morning. And in the morning. Rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. When you come to pray, your personal prayer closet, let it be a place of no distraction whatsoever, where you can be focused. Amen? If you follow through in Mark chapter 1, after he has finished, Peter and the rest, they can, ah, we have been looking for you, Master. Uh -huh. If he hasn't done the business before they come, that would have been the end of it. You see, the excuses we make that our devotional life is paperweight, and we just get to, uh, by the grace of God, I will spend more time tomorrow. Let me just quickly, uh, amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, you are such a loving God. You understand. Well, you understand, but Satan doesn't. Satan does it, right? You cannot build the spiritual power that you have not invested in. It doesn't happen that way. Rising up a great while before day. If you are going to rise up a great while before day, what does that tell you about when you retire? You retire early. Some of us will refuse to go to bed in good time. Are you a thief? Go to bed. <laughs> I was reading about John Wesley at one time. I was shocked to discover he sleeps around 9 o'clock. I said, no wonder. Somebody said they wanted to see him as early as possible the one morning. He said, what's the time? The person said, can I see you at 4 a.m.? He said, he's busy. 5 a.m., he said... 
You know, he's still busy. 7 a.m., he said, mm, he's still busy. Say, sir, if you don't mind me asking, what a, oh, he said, I'm talking to the king of glory then. Four to seven. Four to seven. Three hours in the morning. The Lord will help us. So we see the place of prayer, the importance they attach to it, which informed how they applied themselves. No excuse. They disciplined themselves in order to give time. Listen, what you believe in, what is of value to you, you will make time for it. You, I guarantee you, you will make time for it. I pray the Lord will make us wise men so that we can become men of valor in Jesus' name. In Matthew 6 from verse 9, pattern. Pattern of personal prayer. Matthew chapter 6. And in verse 9, after this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, that's not something the Lord has given us just to parrot. No. He's showing us a pattern of prayer. This is how to pray. Begin with a selfless spirit, with a family spirit. Don't think you are the only child of God, like the Pharisee and the publican that went into the temple to pray. And the Bible says, and the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Oh God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, thieves. And I'm not even like this Pharisee. I don't know whether, I, I mean, this publican. I don't know whether I even pointed at him. And the Bible says he went away, that he prayed with himself. In other words, God didn't even bother. But that publican smote his own bread and said, Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. Jesus said, that one went to me justified. So what are we talking about? This is a pattern of prayer. We pray first and foremost, giving priority to the praise of God, to the exaltation of God, to lifting up our God and understanding that this prayer has to do with a family spirit. It's not just my father. It's the father of all those that are born again. We hallow his name. We desire the coming of his kingdom to rule and reign over all the earth. And then before we present our petition. And in petitioning, look at all the things we need to ask for. And then we close more or less the same way we started. Asking for his kingdom to come because his is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. That is the pattern. But what about the principles and practice? The principles and practice of personal prayer. In that same Matthew chapter 6, if I pick it up from verse 5, it says, And when thou prayest, please, when thou prayest, is different from if thou prayest. If leaves it open that you may decide not to. When implies that you must. Amen? When thou prayest, what should happen? Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. We're talking about personal prayer here. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which sits in secret shall reward thee openly. Amen? Personal prayer. Why don't we have the inspiration, the, the drive? Because nobody is seeing us. For those of us who like speaking in tongues, in fact, that's the best place to be speaking in tongues, right? Just speak in tongues to your heart's content. Amen? That's it. Blow it as much as you want. Amen? Not come and disturb us with your tongue here when we want to pray. Hallelujah. That's it. Pray. Pray. I don't know. I don't know which one I enjoy more, to be honest. I, I'm not even sure. Private prayer, corporate prayer, I, I just enjoy both of them. Because they have their place in your life as a Christian believer. There are things God cannot accomplish in your life if you don't cultivate your personal prayer life. There are some things you cannot accomplish in your life if you are disobedient to coming together with other children of God to pray corporately. So it's not one traded against the other is that we should make use of both. And this personal one, I believe, prepares you even the more, gives you the foundation 
of being a prayerful man. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. And as we pray, what are the principles we can draw? We've seen there already that we shouldn't be hypocrites. We shouldn't be doing things to be seen. No, that, that's not the point. In Matthew 7, and from verse 7, Matthew chapter 7, from verse 7, ask. In praying, we ask. We make requests. Amen? Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receive it. And he that seeketh, find it. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. God said, take my word for it. It shall be opened. Or what man is there of you? By way of illustration now. Whom if his own son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then been evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your heavenly father, your father which is in heaven, give good things to them that, to them that cry, wail, roll on the floor? No, to them that ask him. Hallelujah. And it's interesting that in asking, we fulfilled all the conditions. Ask, seek, knock. All the, and that's ask. Amen? That's it. So we need to be mindful of that principle when we are praying. That all God, see, every need, every request is mine for the asking. That's all. Our faith has to lash onto that. That it is as simple as that. Principles. How do we pray? In what posture do we pray? Oh, you can pray standing. God doesn't feel offended. That why can't you bend it? Bow the knee. Bow the knee. Uh -uh. You can pray standing. There's nothing wrong with that. You can pray kneeling down. I love that one. I love that one. Because it's consistent with the spirit of a beggar. Hallelujah. Oh, I don't mind being a beggar before God. I don't know about you. I don't mind being a beggar. Go on my knees. Amen. You can lie down, but not when you are tired. Because some of you, I can see you are struggling to keep awake. Yeah, but you did where you came because if not, you would have preferred to be sleeping at home. Amen? I'm praying for you, God will change your job. Amen. Sleep is best in the night. It's thieves that don't sleep. Okay? Sleep is best at night. It doesn't matter how good you are as a sleeper. Sleeping during the day is not the same thing. Do you know why? Because the sun is up. Hallelujah. <laughs> you only need to open one eye and see the real sun coming. Someone say, what are you doing on the bed? They say, but I only just came home 5 a.m. this morning. God will change all those jobs. Yeah. We need men to be doing proper jobs. Right? Morning to late afternoon. We have closed. We're going home. You say, but pastor, what about uh, let other people who don't need to be men of valor, let them be doing that one. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So our posture in praying, we can stand, we can kneel down, we can fall upon our face, we can, whatever, in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, I think that's the one I was referring to when I called Luke 21. Matthew 26, and in verse 39, Matthew 26, look at the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In verse 39, here we are told, and he went a little further and did what? And fell on his face. Jesus, he wanted to talk to the father. As it were, the going has got so tough, he fell on his face and prayed. He fell on his face and prayed. So he adopted the posture of falling upon his face. And there's nothing wrong with that if you are not tired. But if already you are struggling to keep away and then you fell on your face, guess what? It's the cock that will wake you up. Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. And you say, ah! You demons. No, it's not demons. <laughs> it's not demons. It's you that you are not wise. Right? So, that's, that's an acceptable posture. And when we come to pray, why have we come to pray? We pray because we believe there's a God in heaven that answers prayer. So when Jesus said, have faith in God, have faith in God. Why do you pray if you don't have faith? How is it that somebody comes to pray and there's no faith in his heart? How come? How come? We are praying because we believe there's a God that answers prayer. Amen? Have faith in God. It says in Mark, uh, Mark chapter 11, Mark 11 from verse 22. Mark chapter 11, and from verse 22, here we are told, have faith in God. Jesus answering said unto them, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he said. Amen. He shall have whatsoever he said. Brethren, let's develop our faith. 
let's take Jesus at his word. It's like D.L. Moody. He will say, Jesus says it, that settles it. Jesus says it, that settles it. Amen? He shall have whatsoever he said in verse 24. Therefore, I say unto you. Therefore, if anybody understood prayer, the dynamics of prayer, the possibilities of prayer, the power of prayer, nobody understands it like the Son of God. The one that has been in the bosom of the Father from eternity. He said, therefore, I say unto you, what things soever ye desire. Anyone we desire here? What things soever ye desire. When ye pray, when ye pray about that desire, believe that ye receive them. And what will happen? And ye shall have them. Let the devil scream in your ears. Like, wait, 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 wait. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Uh, is it that simple? <laughs> you say, devil, you shut. Hold your peace. That's the polite way of shut up. Hold your peace. Because Jesus says, and I believe, believe that you receive them and ye shall have them. You will have them in Jesus' name. And then we are told in verse 25, and when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any, that your father also which is in heaven may forgive your trespass. You see, there are some people, they think they are so special that God has to bend his word for them. Brother so and so, what he did to me, oh no, 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 no. I pray he gets to heaven because I'm going to heaven too. Then the two of us will appear before the almighty. He will have to settle this one. You will not get there. I guarantee you, you will not get there. When you stand praying, what's the posture of praying here? The man stood on his feet, right? It's alive and active. Praying, he says, forgive. If you have ought against any, that your father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Look at verse 26. But if you do not forgive, Neither will your Father which is heaven forgive your trespasses. And don't blame demons. Blame yourself. Or blame the demon of unforgiveness. So what are we talking about? Principles and practice. Why are we looking at these principles? So that when we come to pray, this, this is the way we are going. This is what we are going to put in practice. When we are praying, in Luke chapter 6 verse 12, we are told about Jesus Christ. That he departed to a mountain to pray. And he continued in prayer all night. Let me ask you, my brother. Have you ever done personal night vigil? Or your Jonah's cousin? Jonah found a good place inside that ship. Went to the bottom and, found a, and, and slept. And when the storm hit, and everybody was, you know, scared for their lives. They said, everybody, whatever you believe in, just start praying. It's happened before. I was in an, <laughs> I was in an aircraft. And then this turbulence hit. I didn't know there are so many religious people. The one that is calling some is doing incantation <laughs> because they didn't want to die. And the plane was just misbehaving in mid-air. You know? I just sat down there. If this is the end, so be it. That's how God appointed it, right? But people know it was it was interesting. It was interesting in that aircraft. Until that thing then, you know, settled. And then you look at all the people where they were speaking all kinds of language a short while ago. Now looking calm and still calling for red wine and everything now. <laughs> uh huh. Right? So, what are we talking about? All night prayer. You don't have to do that every day, every week, every month. But what I'm saying to you is that learn to challenge yourself. Some of you, the night vigil you ever had in your life was the one the church did last year. That's all. That was okay, let's come together. I can't even remember when last we had night vigil as men. I know women have tried it a few more times than us. Again, all that has to change. All that has to change. And the fact that at times we even put it on Zoom. You know some people will sign on. And then they are fast asleep. God knows the number of your house. Uh -uh. Fast asleep. It shouldn't be like that. Jesus went out into a mountain to pray. And continued all night in prayer to God. Jesus, the son of God, if he saw the need to do that, maybe you are closer to God than Jesus. You don't need all night prayer. Uh -uh. Come on, man. <laughs> Let's do something. Find some time, even if it's once in a month or once in three months, that you do all night prayer. 
for yourself, for your family, for the church of God, for the city you dwell, everything. All night, that God, I give this night to prayer. And of course, you need to prepare yourself for that. If all the day you have exerted yourself and everything, guess what's going to happen in that all night prayer? It will be all sleep prayer. The Lord himself will help us in Jesus' name. In Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 11, reading here in verse 1, Luke 11, and from verse 1, what are we told? And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Teach us to pray. What I'm trying to bring out there is that do you ever ask the Lord to help you to improve your prayer life? Or you think you're all right? Is that part of your request when you are praying? That God, I, I, want, I, want, to, I want to improve my prayer life. I want, to see, I want to see more power accompany my prayer life. Lord, teach me how to pray even the more. And listen, there's no better teacher in prayer than the Holy Spirit. That's why when Jesus, you know, spoke in Luke's uh, uh, parallel of that same message that you should ask, seek, knock. Matthew said, if ye then been evil, know how to give good gifts unto your own children, just a good gift. How much more shall your heavenly father give good gifts to you that you ask? Luke said, how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Loaded statement. How many of you have deliberately consciously, intentionally spend time praying that God should give you the Holy Spirit and watch the Holy Spirit come in and revolutionize completely, totally transform your prayer life. How much can you pray? In the flesh? No, you need the help of the Spirit. Romans chapter 8 from verse 26. Romans 8 from verse 26. Romans 8 from verse 26. Likewise also, the Spirit does what? Helpeth our infirmities. Look up here. The letter to the Romans was written after the day of Pentecost. Amen? After the day of Pentecost. And yet, we still need the Spirit to help our infirmities. Doesn't that surprise you? I thought we are already post-baptism in the Holy Spirit. That is true. But there's still a lot to learn. And the Spirit is willing to teach. Amen? He's willing to lend us all the help we need in the place of prayer. He's willing to reveal to us the dimensions of prayer that we have no clue right now. Amen? How is it that some men will pray and they have not prayed for more than 10, 15 minutes and they stop? And it's settled in their spirit that it is done. Another man is still praying for three days. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. As mere mortals, we have so much infirmities that we carry with us into the place of prayer. And we need the help of the Spirit. Right? For we know not what we should pray for. Number one problem, ignorance. We know not what we should pray for as we ought. As we ought. So there are two problems there. We don't know. And even as we ought to, is missing. But the Spirit, praise the Lord. But the Spirit is a make it intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. In verse 27, and he that searcheth the heart, that's God the Father. He that searcheth the heart, that's God the Father. Knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he, the Spirit, maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Tell me about lesser guided missile. You can't miss it because the Spirit of God he said, no, 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 what are you saying there? Not like that, not like that. Do you know we presented very poor petitions at times? But we got answers and we think we did well. No, the Holy Ghost took that bad petition and shaped it, what it should be, and then sent it across. Said, that's right. We need the help of the Spirit. We need the help of the Spirit. And we'll have the help of the Spirit in Jesus' name. To have the right standing before God, we need to enroll in Christ's school of prayer. Don't waste time. The semester is open now. Christ's school of prayer and learn the fundamental principles that should inform our practice of personal prayer. Number one, solitude. Secret prayer is so important. 
Number two, petition or asking. We need to ask. We need to know how to make petition. Don't make jealous petition. Bro, that's why so children, they are just topping the class. They are flying colors. Uh -uh. What is wrong with my own children? It's my own children that should be giving testimony. That one is jealousy. That one is not prayer. Okay? Petition stroke asking. Proper posture. In the place of prayer, what's the proper posture? The proper posture is the posture that aids your alertness. That you are alert. Don't pray and start talking nonsense because you are drowsy. You know some people think, curse, behave. Eh, curse. Did I say curse? <laughs> the Yoruba Association, no, no. <laughs> In the place of prayer, the proper posture is the posture that aids alertness. You are alert. Nothing escapes, you know. That's it. What about the aid of fasting? This kind can comfort by nothing, but by prayer and fasting. Mark chapter 9, verse 28 and 29. They came to the Lord and said, why couldn't we cast down that demon? He embarrassed us. Yes, the demons were embarrassed. People were always eating. I never give up food for one day. Jesus said, because of your unbelief, but apart from faith, this kind, this kind can comfort by nothing, but by prayer and fasting. My brother, let me ask you. Do you use personal prayer and fasting? Or is it just the one we do for GCK? Uh, uh, how can that be? How can you, a child of God, you don't have one day of fasting, even if it's in a month, never mind weekly? Why not? Brethren, Jesus says, look, if we are going to be men of valor, we cannot discount this thing. If we are going to be the priestly men that God wants us to be, especially those of us that are heads of families, how can you be? You eat every day? Every day, three square meals. No wonder you're in such a bad shape. No, 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 no. It cannot be that way. We need our own day. We need our time of fasting and prayer. I've already spoke about night vigil. Night vigil. Why not? Doesn't have to be every time. Maybe once in three months, whatever. Engage in personal night vigil. Praying in faith. Or believing. How can somebody stand praying to God and is filled with unbelief? No, don't do that. Don't do that. Prayer of faith. Believing prayer. That's what we do when we come to pray. Then the importance of a forgiving spirit, we have stressed that and they have spoken about the spirit's assistance in the place of prayer. Let's finish with the power and possibilities of personal prayer. James 5 we we'll go back to James chapter 5 and from verse 16. James chapter 5 and from verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias, Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly. That it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Look up here. Does, has it registered on your mind that we are talking about one man in Israel prayed, and heaven was shut up? One man, not a congregation, not an assembly of God or something. One man stood before God and prayed, and the heavens held range for three years and six months, okay? That's the impact of that prayer. But listen, that prayer can do and undo. That's why in verse 18 it says, and he prayed again. Three and a half years has expired now. He prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth a food. When we talk about the power of prayer, we are talking about that prayer effecting exactly what we have requested for. That's the power. Amen? And that power is coming from the performance of the one we prayed to. Prayer is powerful because of the person we are praying to. Hallelujah. Prayer affects all possibilities because we are praying to the God of all possibilities. The power and possibilities of personal prayer. In 2 Kings chapter 1, I'm reading here from verse 10. We'll round up very soon because our time is fast disappearing in 10 minutes. I don't know where they got that from. I thought it should be like 5 minutes. <laughs> Second Kings chapter 1 
I'm reading from verse, from verse 10. 2 Kings chapter 1. Reading here from verse 10. If you pick it up from verse 7. And he said unto them, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? That I should come back and tell me that I will not get up from that bed of sickness. I will surely die. Which man said that to you? In verse 8. And they answered him. He was an hairy man. And got with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. It is Elijah the Tishbite. Then the king, verse 9, sent unto him a captain of 50. Which is 50. And he went up to him. And behold, he sat on the top of an hill. And he spake unto him. Thou man of God. The king has said, come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, If I be a man of God. Hallelujah. If I be a man of God. Oh, you see, at times I read things in the Bible. I'm saying, God help me. God help me. If I be a man of God. What? Then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy 50. And there came down fire from heaven and consume... <laughs> They were gone. Who? Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Is that real? Or is that a motion picture? No, that's real. If I be a man of God, and heaven said, no, you are. You are. You are a man of God. Hallelujah. You see, that ignorant king has sacrificed 51 people. And instead of mourning with their family and everything, he said, what? Okay. Second round. <laughs> that captain. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with that captain. Why not to resign? That you are not a soldier anymore. <laughs> right? Again, also, he sent unto him another captain of 50, which is 50. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus had the king said, Come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto them, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy 50. And what happened? And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. And he sent again. He sent again a captain of the third 50, which is 50. And the third captain, wise man. A very wise man. And the third captain of the 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah. And besought him and said, oh man of God, I pray thee. <laughs> Hallelujah. Why are the people doing nonsense with you? Because you are not a man of God. <laughs> That's why. You become a man of God. They will grow very, they will grow when they come. He said, fell on his face and said, Oh man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these 50 thy servants be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came fire down from heaven. So they had. It's not that they didn't hear. <laughs> and burnt up the two captains of the former 50s with their 50s. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, go with him. Tell me the next phrase. Be not afraid. Look up here. Elijah is a man subject to like passion. Actually, with all this happening, fear was in Elijah's heart. He was afraid. So he went to the top of the mountain. At least if they will catch me, they will not climb. <laughs> they will need to climb before they can catch me. Be not afraid. Go with them. Now, do you see what I'm saying to you? He was afraid, but he had authority. If I be, you think you, you can just go to the market and say, if I be a man of God, nothing will happen. <laughs> Before whom I stand, that's what made all the difference. So that we now say, if I be a man of God, everyone says, sure, you are. You are. Why? Because you understand the secret of the secret place. That's why you are a man of God. Prayer is so powerful because of the response of the all-powerful, omnipotent God. As the God of all possibilities, he answers prayers and makes all things possible. Those that will be much for God must be much with God. There is no man of God apart from prayer. There is no man of God apart from prayer. Standing before him frequently in prayer is what builds our status. Is what builds our position, our reputation with God. And those that will have power with God and with men must be men of wrestling in the place of prayer. And do you know the promise we have? 
God says, I will pour upon them the spirit of grace and of supplication. Zechariah 12, verse 8. Verse 8 says, the feeble among them will be as David. Think about that. The feeble one amongst us will be as David. And the house of David as the house of God. He said, and I will pour upon them, the, the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications. Amen? Because with that spirit of grace and supplication, we'll do exploits for the Lord. Think about it. Peter went past the upper coast of Joppa, and they say, oh, Dorcas is dead. They've laid her, and they brought him to where. So he put all of them out, and they knelt down by the corpse. He said, Tabitha, arise. And Dorcas got up. And all those in that region who heard about it, they turned their lives over to the Lord. These are the kind of exploits we need. And which is why we must be men of prayer. So that we have spiritual authority. We have spiritual power. See how all those people turned unto the Lord. And in Matthew 21, as we close, Matthew 21 and from verse 21. Matthew 21 and from verse 21. And verse 22. Look at what the Lord himself, from the blessed lips of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let this encourage you. Let this inspire you. To be a praying man. To be a man that can say with Elijah, before whom I stand. Talking about the time you spend in the presence of God in the secret place of prayer. Matthew 21 from verse 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, verily I say unto you. Another word for verily is amen. Assuredly. Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not. Ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if he shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. Possibilities of personal prayer in verse 22, and all things. Please, the Lord didn't make a mistake when he said all things. All things to do with your personal life. All things to do with your devotional life. All things to do with your family life. All things to do with your business life. Everything that concerns you and all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. You shall receive. Amen. Does that stir up the spirit of prayer in anyone here? That Jesus said, this is the dynamics. This is the pattern. This is the principle to follow. And ye shall receive. Jesus said so. That settles it. I said that settles it. For those that God has poured upon them the spirit of grace and of supplication, there are unlimited possibilities in life and ministry. Brethren, this is how men of valor are made in the place of prayer. This is how priestly men are fashioned in the place of prayer because they've learned the secret of what it means when Elijah said, before whom I stand. Rise on your feet and let's pray. A man of God will teach on Holy Ghost baptism and all the rest. And when he has finished, just as I finished now, he won't leave you in this room. I say that is the theory. For those of you that are interested in the practical, follow me. And we'll move out and take them to another room. If you come into that room, the door locked. You are going to pray until he releases you. Now we've heard about prayer. And the trouble is, it's not that we've not been hearing about prayer, but after we have heard, then we commit the unpardonable sin by then not praying. No. When you've heard a sermon on prayer, that is when to really pray. What did you hear? What did you hear? That is what to pray about right now. You have heard about the place and patterns of personal prayer. You've heard about the principles and practice of personal prayer. You've heard about the power and possibilities of personal prayer. Now it's time to talk to the God of heaven. Pray, my brother. Pray, my sister. Because I guarantee you, I trust those women. There are some of them who say, I must pinch something from this men's conference. And they were hearing all I was telling you. And they said they want to go higher. 
They want to go higher. They don't want to rest on their laurels. My brother, pray. Call upon the God of heaven. That God, whatever you need to do, please do it. I have to be a praying man. I have to be a prayer warrior. Brethren, what is it in this present life that God cannot deal with by the power of the prayer of faith? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Pray and tell the Lord, it is time to improve my standing before you. My status, my position, my reputation in the courts of heaven. That heaven is familiar with the tone of my voice. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Are you praying or are you fainting? The antidote to fainting is praying. If that faint in the day of adversity, that strength is small. But the same Lord told us, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Oh, what wretched spirituality. If we are prayerless. Have you found the secret of fasting and prayer? Have you added the dimension of night vigil? Personal. And get yourself some respect from the kingdom of darkness. As God puts authority upon your life. If you are going to command the firstborn of death. To go back and send his father. That takes some doing. Pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. The Lord will give us the grace to pray. Let's pray. And the Lord will transform your prayer life. And the Lord will transform your prayer life. The Lord will transform your prayer life. That you will have a prayer life. You have a work life. A family life, you must have a prayer life. Pray the Lord, I pray for a prayer life. It is non negotiable. I pray for a personal prayer life. You have family life, you have work life, you are a married man, you must have a prayer life. It is non negotiable. Pray.
In Jesus' name we pray.